We would like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, Pekani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsuna First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nations. The City of Calgary is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today at the Simpson Center Public Education Series event, Stuck in the Middle, Farm Sizes in Canadian Agri-Food. Uh, this webinar series is presented by the UFA and RCF and hosted at the Simpson Center at the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. My name is John Bailey. I'm a research associate at the Simpson Center and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Uh, just a little bit about the format of the event. We're going to uh, just go over the format now, obviously, and talk about some ground rules. There'll be three polls throughout the event. Um, the first one will be coming up shortly. And so basically we'll take a minute to look at the polls and answer them. The results will come in live and then I can share the results with you uh, and the panelists so that we get a bit of a sense of uh, your experience in the area and um, your sense of the issue. Um, in addition, there'll be two presentations um, from our speakers, Dr. Sarah Epp and Dr. Andre Magnon, um, and I'll introduce them a little bit before they do their presentations. And I just wanted to mention that if you have any questions or comments, uh, please leave them in the chat box. Any questions that you have, we have an upvote feature. So if there's more people who have the same kind of question, just look through and upvote it. And we'll get to that at the end. Uh, after the two presentations, there'll be a little Q&A and discussion session. So with that, uh, we'll start the first poll, I suppose. It will pop up on your screen. I can read it out loud also. In your opinion, can farmers and producers operate at the scale of their choice? Uh, and so make your choice. We'll, just, we'll, we'll spend a little minute here waiting for that. And then when it comes back, then uh, we can share the results and we'll move on to a presentation from Dr. Menu. Let's see, it says yes, choice two and unsure. Let's say choice two means no. Okay, so once again, in your opinion, can farmers and producers operate at the scale of their choice? Looks like a pretty even distribution. 33% uh, said yes, 28% said no, and 40% almost at 39% said unsure. So it seems like there is some room to learn in this session today. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce Dr. Andre Mignon, who is the Associate Professor of Sociology uh, and Associate Professor of Sociology and Social Studies at the University of Regina. <clears throat> His research and teaching interests include the sociology of agri-food systems, globalization and development, and sociological theory. He has two principal areas of research. First, he studies the financialization of agri-food systems with a focus on changing patterns of farmland ownership and control. Second, he has examined the history and politics of grain marketing on the Canadian prairies, in particular, the rise and fall of the Canadian wheat board. Uh, his research on the history of the Canada-UK wheat trade and the CWB is published in 2016 as a book entitled When Wheat Was King. And uh, we'll open the floor to Dr. Mignon. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, John, for that uh, introduction. I'm going to share my screen with everyone so you can see my presentation, of course. And I'll just uh, let everybody know that uh, I'm speaking to you today from Treaty 4 uh, territory in Regina. I'm really pleased to uh, be here and share some of my recent uh, research with you. I think the poll uh, that uh, you just posted, John, is, is a really uh, interesting one. It's a really important um, question. And one of my goals uh, in this presentation is to provide something of an, an answer to, to that question. Uh, I'd like to tell you, first of all, a bit about uh, the, the research that I and some colleagues have been doing over the last uh, few years. Uh, we've uh, been involved in a four-year project looking at farm consolidation, land concentration, and financialization of farmland in the Prairie region, Alberta, Saskatchewan, Manitoba. 
As part of that research, uh, we've done a number of things. We have uh, obtained the complete set of land titles for farmland in Saskatchewan, and that's one part of our analysis. Uh, we've done a special run of Statistics Canada uh, data from the Census of Agriculture to answer a few of our questions. We conducted a survey uh, with uh, 400 prairie farmers across the three provinces. I'll be telling you a bit about that later on uh, today. And um, our graduate students also did quite a bit of field research in Alberta, Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba, a few dozen interviews with farmers in different regions of the prairie prov provinces uh, precisely to, to get their uh, feelings and their ideas about what is happening in their local areas in terms of land concentration and farm consolidation. Uh, so yeah, today I will mostly, uh, uh, well, I'll be doing a couple of things. I'll be uh, saying a bit about our analysis of consolidation and what the recent trends are. And the, the second part, a little bit more briefly, will be to tell you a bit about how uh, we believe farmers are experiencing these trends on the ground in the places that they live. Uh, before we started, I wanted to give a quick plug to uh, our project website called landfoodsovereignty.ca. Uh, it's actually home for a couple of different research projects, uh, but the one I'm speaking about today is, is housed uh, at this uh, site. And uh, we have posted some of our reports and scholarly publications to this website. So uh, there's lots more to, to learn if you're interested by visiting landfoodsovereignty.ca. Okay, I'm gonna begin with a, a few uh, trends that probably will surprise or shock uh, no one. They may seem a little bit uh, uh, obvious, but I think it's important to set the scene. Uh, we know that farm numbers in uh, Saskatchewan have been declining for many decades. I think the peak was in the early 40s, if I'm not mistaken. So that's not terribly new. Uh, but I did want to put a few figures to these trends over the last uh, 40 uh, or so years, 30 years rather. Uh, so between 1991 and 2001, uh, 10,000 farms in Saskatchewan disappeared. That was a 17% decline. And then between 2001 and uh, 2021, a further uh, 16,500 farms were lost, which was a 33% uh, decline. Uh, so uh, not only are we losing farms, but uh, the rate at which we are losing farms is actually accelerating. And uh, now that I look at it, I think the second bullet point there should read between 1981 and 2001. I think I was working with 20 year intervals uh, to show again that, that the, the rate at which we are losing farms has actually uh, increased. Now, with the very uh, recent release of 2021 Census of Agriculture data, it seems there's been a little bit of a slowdown between 2016 and, and uh, 2021 in terms of the numbers of farms that have uh, disappeared. So that's interesting. We'll have to see if that is a trend that holds up, if there's a, a bit of a slowdown in the rate at which we are losing farms. Next, I wanted to show you a couple of figures from our special run of Census of Agriculture data. We were interested in uh, posing a number of questions about how farms of different sizes, how much, how much farmland they represent in terms of land that they own and rent, land that is a part of their farming operation. And we wanted to visualize this trend uh, over time. So we uh, divided the farm population in Saskatchewan into a number of size categories and then asked the question how much farmland is owned and rented by those uh, operations of different sizes at different historical periods. You can see uh, with the, the, the legend here uh, that over time smaller farms less than a thousand acres have been that the share of farmland that they control has declined steeply uh, until uh, 2016. 
of farms in a kind of middle class here between 1,000 and 3,000 acres have also declined in terms of how much land they control. The only categories uh, for which the amount of land controlled has increased are those larger than 3,000 acres. Uh, and we can see some quite dramatic increases in the amount of land controlled by farms over 5,000 acres, and, uh, between 5,000 and 10,000 acres, and over 10,000 acres. So this is a clear trend, I think, uh, that again, many people may already understand, uh, but uh, it's a different way of capturing uh, average farm size. Uh, and I think it's a more accurate way and more helpful way to think about how uh, farms are, are getting bigger. Because after all, uh, the average farm size, according to the census of agriculture is something around 1800 acres. Uh, but to me, this kind of chart better represents what's happening. Farms in the largest uh, sizes here are really the ones that have been increasing in numbers and in increasing the amount of land they control. Here's a, a similar uh, set of uh, figures. Uh, this, uh, the, the difference in this uh, figure is that it represents the uh, proportion or percentage of farmland controlled by farms of different sizes. This is a snapshot from 2016. Again, using the same size categories, uh, we can see that farms uh, between three and 5,000 uh, acres, for example, they control about 20% of farmland in Saskatchewan. The five to 10,000 acre range controls a further 20%, 21%. And those over 10,000 acres actually control about 18%. And the blue bars are the share uh, in terms of number of farms um, each category, the percentage of the number of farms. So you have a tiny uh, proportion of farms here, the 10,000 and above, that controls 18% of, of the land for farm production, uh, and so on and so forth. So we still have a large number of smaller farms, but the share of land that they own and control uh, is, uh, is getting smaller over time. Okay, a few more facts uh, from uh, the 2016 Census of Agriculture. We don't have these figures for 2021. When we did the special run uh, back in 2018, only the 2016 figures were available. Uh, we were able to determine that farms over 5,000 acres account for 38% of farmland owned and rented in the province, but only 8% of farms. So we were interested in uh, ways of ways of talking about farmland inequality, right? Uh, we talk about income inequality, wealth inequality. Uh, for us, this kind of figure, this kind of fact captures land inequality, a small number of farms uh, accounting for controlling nearly 40% uh, of the land in the province. When we look at farms over 10,000 acres, they account for 18% of farmland, but they're only 2% of farm. So again, uh, I think it's fair to say that land inequality in uh, Saskatchewan is, uh, is getting uh, wider and wider. Uh, as I mentioned when I was uh, talking about the uh, charts, a uh, previous chart, it's only farms larger than 3,000 acres that have been increasing their share of farmland, uh, farmland acres since 1996. The farms in the smaller categories uh, have uh, been representing a smaller and smaller share of total farmland since about 1996. We're also interested in looking at uh, mega farms, which we defined as those with over 30,000 acres. We were able to determine that there are 54 of these mega farms in uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, so maybe uh, that may come as a surprise to, uh, to some of you. That's a, uh, to me, it's striking because most people don't know very much about some of these huge uh, operations, and yet there's a good number of them. They don't have much of a public profile, except for a small uh, number, uh, but there are nowadays a good number of these really, really huge uh, farming operations.
Now, everything I've spoken about so far is really about farm consolidation in terms of farms, farms getting larger overall, uh, including owned and rented land. We were also interested in understanding ownership concentration. So strictly the uh, acres owned by different individuals, entities, uh, and farms. We were able to determine that in 2016, farms uh, that uh, are larger than 5,000 acres owned 27% of all owner-operated farmland in the three prairie provinces. We excluded land owned by governments, utilities, and so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, still, that's, a, again, a small number of farms that are uh, that actually own over a quarter of all owner-operated farmland in the prairie provinces. When we looked at the land titles uh, data, we did a number of things to kind of narrow down the largest landowners in the province. We eliminated utilities, uh, governments, uh, First Nations, uh, Hutterite colonies, and we wanted to know of those left over, uh, who were the landowners with over 10,000 acres each. We uh, were able to, to determine that there's about 32 private entities, mostly individuals, uh, some families, some numbered companies, that each own about, uh, that each own over 10,000 acres, and together as a group account for nearly half a million acres, which is a, a little bit under 1% of all the farmland in uh, in the, in the province. We looked at uh, investors, uh, different investor um, entities. Uh, some are, are corporate, uh, some are financial entities, some are wealthy individuals, uh, and determined that there are 42 important investor entities that own about 970,000 acres of farmland, which is uh, around 1.6%. So as far as we're concerned, these are the largest private non-governmental landowners uh, in the province and together you know 60 some entities that own well over two percent of all the farmland in the province okay i'm keeping one eye uh, on the time uh, i hope to wrap up in uh, in 15 minutes or less but i'd like to say a bit about uh, what we found when we uh, spoke to farmers, when we uh, surveyed them, and when we conducted our field research uh, with them. I'll begin with a few results from our survey of prairie farmers. We asked them uh, if land ownership was becoming more concentrated in their area. 75% of them indicated that yes, it was becoming more concentrated. And then of those who did say it was getting more concentrated, we asked, uh, you know, to what extent is this becoming a problem? And we found that 24% believed it had become a major problem, 44% somewhat of a problem. So I think clearly something that many farmers view as um, a problematic trend in their own areas. We next asked them, okay, so what are some of the, the important problems that come along with this trend of land concentration? And here are uh, the, the types of things that they uh, indicated. The, the most important, according to our survey respondents, was that uh, large land owners are able to outcompete smaller players for land. 60% of those who believed that this had become a problem said that this was one of the important problems. Uh, you know, very, very similarly, many said that it meant less land was available for sale or for rent. Many noted that with concentration uh, comes fewer farmers in the area. So they were talking about farmer exit and depopulation of their local communities. And others cited negative impacts on uh, the local community, nearly 40%. Uh, uh, now, uh, obviously these uh, numbers don't add up to 100. Uh, respondents were able to, to choose uh, several different uh, problems, and that's that's why uh, you get these uh, these different percentages. I wanted to share a few uh, a few quotes from our qualitative uh, research uh, conducted by our wonderful uh, graduate students uh, in rural communities around the prairies. 
I think the, the major themes that we found uh, were that uh, farmers are concerned about increasing land inequality, about increasing competitive pressure in their own local land markets, and about some of the socio-environmental changes that are happening in their communities as a result of these uh, trends. Um, so I wanted to share uh, this first quote uh, with you, with uh, uh, one of our farmer respondents said, more and more we're finding it's not just one quarter that comes up for rent, it's the whole farm. So three to four to 5,000 acre chunks that are coming up at one go. Whereas in the past we would have rented one field from one family and uh, four fields from another and so on. Uh, now it's 5,000 acres at a go. So talking about some of the challenges in renting land when it's consolidated into these large blocks that are all rented out all in one piece, very typically to large uh, operators and making it more difficult for smaller operators to uh, rent a little bit of land, for instance. Uh, this one is also about this, this idea of aggregating land into bigger and bigger blocks. The respondent said, as soon as you get one investment company that owns 50, 75, or 100 sections, well, then they're big enough. They have enough control of the land block that many people or many organizations would be interested in it. It's so risky now because the land blocks that come up are so large for one farm family's finances to take that on. So it leaves it, leaves it open to somebody else that has more behind them, usually a large corporation or something. So again, as these land blocks get larger and larger, the types of entities or players or individuals who really can consider uh, bidding on them or buying them, uh, that pool of buyers is getting smaller and smaller. It's really uh, a big corporation, a big investor uh, that would be interested and able to acquire that kind of land. And uh, this last one I wanted to uh, present is more to do with environmental impacts. Uh, so this farmer said from the biodiversity end of it, when a quarter changes hands from a smaller operator to a bigger one, everything is cleared, broken, even the shelter belts in the yard site and everything. Small guys keep the habitat there. I like my farm because on each corner, there's about a quarter or a, a third of the land that is still made of habitat, wetland, bush, trees, grass, it's great for wildlife. Unfortunately, I'm becoming more of an island as everything around me gets bulldozed, cleared, and drained. And so this is representative of a number of comments that we found in different uh, areas where farms, uh, farmers observed that some of the bigger players and sometimes the investment companies uh, include in their business model this idea of uh, draining the land, clearing the, the bush, uh, clearing the, the home quarter, making the land more uniform, more homogenous, uh, maximizing the number of acres that can be farmed. Uh, and that comes at an ecological and social cost, according to our, our uh, respondents. Okay, well, that was a quick enough tour, I, I hope, of uh, some of uh, our main uh, uh, findings. I just wanted to uh, reinforce a few uh, messages. I think that a common finding uh, across the survey and interviews was that farmers are very concerned about increasing farmland concentration and investor activity. And I want to stress that this is really felt at the local level. It may not be every farmer that is experiencing this, but those who reported that their neighbors to, you know, a really huge farm or their neighbors to investor owners uh, were often those who were most concerned about these types of trends. So, you know, my sense is that these effects are felt at the local level, even though investors only own, you know, 1.6% of the land. Uh, if they're in your neighborhood, it can have a big impact on what's possible or what's impossible. Uh, for you as a smaller or medium-sized producer. Uh, second message, uh, farmers are, are facing a lot of challenges purchasing and renting land. Land markets are tight, they are competitive, uh, and um, it's frustrating and difficult for, for, for some farmers who find that they're not able to compete. Uh, third message, consolidation and concentration lead to a ratchet effect in land markets 
when these blocks of land are aggregated into bigger and bigger chunks, uh, it makes it really difficult for the smaller and medium sized uh, farmers to bid on those, to compete for those. And the worry is that that will create a kind of vicious cycle of further concentration. And so as far as I'm concerned, one of the big policy challenges is indeed figuring out how to make it possible for farms of different sizes to uh, coexist, uh, to, to compete, to access land when they need it. And I think there's a worry about anti-competitive effects of land consolidation and concentration. When landowners or farm operators become really giant, I think that locally the effect can be to outcompete, to squeeze out uh, smaller and medium farms. And I think that's something we should be uh, thinking very seriously about. So that is, uh, that is my, my last takeaway. I just, uh, on this slide, want to say a few uh, thank yous. I won't read it all out, uh, but uh, I've listed our research team here, and I want to acknowledge that we are funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council. Thanks very much. I hope I, I kept to time, John. Yeah, pretty good. You did. Okay, thank it was you. a great presentation. Thank you very much. There's, um, I see a couple of questions. So, uh, Gord, we'll get to yours uh, definitely after the fact. They're great questions. But one point of clarification is the data pre being presented both crop and livestock farms? Yes. Yeah. It, yeah. It included uh, both. Uh, for the qualitative uh, research, we did focus on crop crop farms. Some some were mixed, but. Um, uh, they were either mixed or crop farms. Great. Well, thank you so much again, Doctor. That's awesome. No problem. Um, so we're going to have another quick poll before we move on to our next presentation. Uh, I'll, I'll say it out loud and it'll come up on your screen there. So in your opinion, what is the main driver that is causing farmers and producers to change their scale of operation? It's a multiple choice question. The answers are economic, environmental, social, other, or unsure. So just take a couple of seconds to click that in and we'll see what the results are in a minute. Okay, so the results are back. We have a pretty resounding 91% uh, believe that economic is the main driver that is causing farmer and producers to change their scale of operations. 9% indicating social and 9% saying they're unsure. So that's a pretty strong, pretty strong signal. <laughs> uh, okay, so with that, I'd like to present Dr. Sarah Epp to present next. She is an assistant professor uh, in rural planning and development at the School of Environmental Design and Rural Development at the University of Guelph. And her research interests are related to social and agricultural planning in northern and southern Ontario, examining issues related to farmland loss, agricultural viability, land use conflicts, and social aspects of rural life. She has a diverse background in agricultural planning, including measuring farmland loss in the greater Golden Horseshoe, exploring the value of agricultural advisory committees within southern Ontario, and planning for agricultural expansion and local food development in northern Ontario. More recently, Sarah's examined rural migration and social transformation within rural communities. So with that, thank you, Sarah, the floor is yours. Excellent, thanks, John. Well, hello everyone. I'll say good afternoon because it is afternoon here in Ontario. And I'll note that I am joining you from Guelph, which is in Southern Ontario. And I am located within the Between the Lakes Purchase of Treaty 3, which is the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credits. I'm really happy to be here today and, and happy to share some of the, the research I've been working on, share some of the lessons, I guess we can say. I think we're almost at a crisis point in Ontario regarding agricultural land availability, loss of farmland, um, and a whole host of other challenges right now. So happy to share some of those insights, some of those lessons, um, and definitely some of the applicability, I think, 
perhaps to, to the more Western provinces in Canada, given that Ontario is a little bit unique, but I think um, with land consolidation, which we're seeing here in Ontario as well, uh, the economic aspect, which no surprise to see that so high. I think any anybody involved in agriculture will absolutely tell you economics drives almost everything um, and a host of other little aspects that I'll try to get through in about 15 to 20 minutes. It'll be very quick and sort of um, short overviews, but I'll show you if you're interested where you can find some more of the, the reports and things that I'm referencing. So a quick overview of today's talk. I will provide a bit of research context, so let you know the things I look at, the things I study, why I study what I do, and then focus on some policy impacts, and, and one in particular, a provincial policy here in Ontario that I think has had some significant impacts on land availability, the cost of farmland, and on top of that, some of the social and cultural aspects of agriculture and some shifts we're seeing and, and how that relates to rural migration. The migration piece has been um, really complicated with COVID-19. We're seeing that sort of renaissance of back to rural, which has been something that's been fascinating and a lot of conflict attached with that. Um, and especially about who the land is available to, farmland in particular. And then just a couple little notes on the future of farming, and in particular that, that sort of middle, what's going to happen to that middle, and how can we ideally ensure that that middle still exists and we don't just have these extremes of the really, really small sort of niche farm and the really, really large farm on the other side. Of course, the Ontario numbers are nowhere near what we see in the prairies, and I won't be getting into the numbers today, but just to note the consolidation is absolutely happening here as well. So I always feel like I need to start with a bit of a disclaimer before I get into my presentations. <clears throat> I did grow up on a family farm in Southern Ontario. And so much of those experiences, what I always call the good, the bad, and the ugly, uh, have informed my vision for agriculture and my commitment to the agricultural community. I'm incredibly fortunate that the position I was hired into is focused on planning for agri-food systems. And it's an incredibly broad term. So I really get to structure what I want to look at and what I want to study, which has been fantastic from a personal perspective as well as professionally. But I think the thing to note for myself is that all of my research is very much community engaged scholarship. So I work directly with rural communities, with agricultural stakeholders, um, have participants throughout the entire research process so that you really get that context specific research and understanding at the, the ground level, which I think is critical when we're talking about agriculture. So some of the things that I've looked at, and I'll, I'll touch on fairly briefly in this presentation, um, focus on things like farmland preservation, a huge topic in Ontario right now. We have an election coming up in about a week, and interestingly enough, farmland preservation is one of the top topics that we see coming up. Attached to that is land use conflict, and, and here we see a lot of amenity development. I think farms can be beautiful. This image on the screen looks lovely, taken with a, a very nice camera and probably something that would go into a real estate advertisement. However, I think anybody in agriculture knows these are working landscapes. They aren't these sort of bucolic, romanticized places that many migrants think they are. And so because our planning policies often situate subdivisions right next to farm fields, we have a lot of conflict that emerges. Rural migration being something that I think is coming up more and more, especially with COVID-19, as again, we see more of that migration back to rural places and the pushing out of some long-term residents or those attached to farming in particular, which I will talk about today. And then the last piece, which I find um, has been something of topic here in Ontario, given development pressures in the southern part of the province, is looking at the expansion of agriculture in the north and this sort of belief that we can transform the north into um, an oasis of agriculture and that we can lose the land in the southern part of the province and really replace agriculture or replace that land base in the north, which, spoiler alert, is not going to happen, but it's something that I, I think we see a lot of lobbying around, a lot of pressure to encourage, and for those farmers who are, are making that movement, that migration to the north, um, a lot of false promises as a result. So some policy implications get into that piece first. The, the thing about um, agricultural land in southern Ontario, and I, I think it's almost at a crisis point, we're, we're almost there within the province, is that we see farmland being valued for the land and not the farm. And I think in any urban area that has farmland adjacent to it, this isn't unique. It's something that happens uh, essentially across the country. But I think within southern Ontario, where we see most of our urban expansion happening, the easiest places to, de to develop our farmland. And in response to that, we have a green belt, which 
which really does have some very restrictive policies on what can happen on land. There's about 2.6 million acres, I think, that are protected through the green belt, which is quite significant. It is a huge area. And it really was meant to stop sort of urban sprawl, protect the land from development, and make sure that the, the best soil, which all prime agricultural land, is available for future generations. Of course, when we have policies, the impacts and implications of those policies aren't always felt immediately. They're not something that we necessarily recognize until it's happening. And we've seen a lot of sort of negative outcomes attached to that policy. So the fantastic piece is, yes, it's protected the land. We have this land available. It's amazing. Some of the unintended consequences, though, of that are things like raising farmland values, especially on farmland that isn't protected by the green belt. It's going up in value because it has development value attached to it. Land within the green belt has high amenity value. It's in some beautiful places. It's in relatively close proximity of Toronto. So we know with tourism and things like rural estates, this farmland is valued quite significantly just to um, become a tourist destination or again, somewhere to build a mansion and sod over a farm. We see some farm consolidation happening in the southern part of the province, but in comparison to the numbers that Andre shared, I mean, farm sizes in Ontario are significantly smaller. I think the average farm size is like 250 acres, so nothing compared to the prairie provinces, but quite significant in the southern part of the province where we see very productive farms that are 25 acres in size. So that consolidation is absolutely happening here, and it is driving up again the cost of farmland, the value of farmland, and who can get into farming as as a result. And so for new entrants in particular, it becomes incredibly difficult to buy into farming. The land base is one of the most expensive aspects. And on top of that, it's all the capital investment that has to come with that. And, and whether you're getting into livestock like dairy, which is incredibly expensive and difficult, or even into um, cash cropping, you still have to have the investment available. And when we're talking about farms costing millions of dollars, it's absolutely pushing out any potential new entrants and even those that are looking at succession farming. So what we've seen, and, and quite recently in particular, is this really interesting rural migration. And so due to COVID-19, we saw a lot of migration from the sort of greater Toronto area into more rural places in southern Ontario. And as a result of that exurban migration, an increasing movement of farmers out of the southern part of the province to the more northern parts of the province, because there's a, a sense that there's an abundance of land here, and land is significantly cheaper in comparison to the southern part of the province. So to give you a little bit of perspective on that cost. In some of the regions in southern Ontario, farm land per acre could go anywhere from twenty to thirty thousand uh, dollars per acre. So incredibly high value for what you're getting. And again, the farm sizes are quite small. In the northern part of the province, depending on where you're looking, the cost of farmland could be anywhere from five hundred to fifteen hundred dollars an acre, maybe as much as three thousand dollars an acre, and really just significantly cheaper and significantly larger parcels as well. So in in the southern part of the province, you may find on average, depending on where you are, maybe a 100 acre parcel. In the north, you could get anywhere from 100 acres to 2000 acres. So significantly different scale in the north. And depending on what your motivations and ambitions are, a, a really sense of a, a lot more opportunity if someone is willing to move to the northern part of the province. What's really interesting and is attached to that are a lot of social and cultural factors and, and this um, sense that within the rural parts of the province and migration in particular of those exurban migrants into rural southern Ontario, there's been a shift in these rural communities and, and what the community was at one point and who, um, who's welcome there and who has access to the land has changed and a lot of negative outcomes have resulted as, um, as an outcome of that migration. And so socially for farmers, in particular for thinking of things like uh, land use conflict, moving away from residents is ideal because you can farm and not worry about your neighbor complaining about spray drift or complaining about the noise of a tractor or any of those other aspects, which are all normal farm practices and part of the everyday life of a working landscape, but have resulted in a lot of conflict over the past few years. And a lot of this really is just ignorance and not understanding the landscape we're dealing with. But again, another sort of pressure that pushes farmers away from these fairly traditional landscapes of agriculture to other areas where the, the challenges and the complications potentially are less. And so what we've seen then is this northern migration that's happening. 
And I, I want to stress that when I say Northern, I'm referring only to Northern Ontario. Many of the communities that we're looking at in Northern Ontario are still south of Winnipeg. So not Northern Canada or not much of the, the sort of latitude of much of the country, but in terms of the, the soil and the climate, very, very different from the Southern part of the province. But of course, recognizing that many places in Canada, those on the line today, um, absolutely part of that community are much farther north than the area I am referring to. But with that said, there is a lot of opportunity in the north and there is a history of agriculture in the north. It is attached to a lot of boom and bust cycles and this is related in particular to um, the industries that also attract some of the same workers. So things like logging or forestry, aggregates, mines, they tend to attract the same sort of, of um, people who are interested in working physically laborious jobs. And those industries also go through boom and bust. So agriculture has really struggled when those industries are doing quite well because they're much more lucrative than farming would be. But the interesting thing, especially when we're talking about the land availability and the cost of land, is it does provide opportunities for new entrants in particular. And we do see that happening. Many of the folks that are moving north, those that tend to be younger, those that are moving on their own, don't necessarily have a history of agriculture, which has a whole host of its own complexities, but they see this as their opportunity to get into agriculture. There's no hope to buy a farm in Southern Ontario, but given the lower price, and seemingly abundant landscape, it's, there's way more opportunity for new entrants to get in. Those that are looking at expanding their operations, there's a number that uh, farmers that still hold their land in Southern Ontario and have bought additional land in the North for things like cash crops. And really one of the, the most positive spin-offs I think to this migration is the, the sort of resilience of rural communities. And we know that for rural communities to survive, they need a population base. And the risk of things like farm consolidation is you lose the population because you're losing those that live there, the individual farmers, the farm families, and, and the spin-offs that come with that. And we're seeing in some of these rural places that with this new migration, the rural communities are doing quite well. And they're all of a sudden the schools have children in them and the local businesses have people who can buy their product or they can support. So it's an interesting sort of transition that's happening and having some significant uh, community benefits. But I have to stress, it's not all sort of sunshine and rainbows. And I think there's a, a sense that we can just recreate Southern Ontario's farming community in the North and it'll be easy. And it's definitely not the case. In Southern Ontario, it's abundantly prime agricultural land. So the soil quality of one through three, which is the most productive soil there is. In the Northern part of the province, uh, you're lucky if you're getting clay soil, which is still about uh, on the scale, it's maybe a four, maybe a five. There's large pockets of rocks. <clears throat> it's not necessarily the best landscape for agriculture and especially for certain types of agriculture. Tender fruit, which grows really well in the southern part of the province, isn't going to grow in the northern part. You can't recreate that up there. Access to services is quite limited. So even things like veterinarians, a study I just completed, access to veterinarians is incredibly low in the north. So if you have any type of livestock, you're lucky if you have a veterinarian who is available to you. We heard from farmers uh, who had to sign off liability waivers that they didn't expect emergency care from the veterinarian because they were just too far away. And if you're a livestock farmer, you can imagine that this is your livelihood and to know that you won't have emergency care is, is quite scary. But again, this, this, this logic isn't there when we're pushing folks to move to the north. It's just there's soil, there's land, it's abundant, it's cheap, you should go. And it's not necessarily recognition that Yes, the land is there, but it does require a lot of inputs. It requires clearing of the land, draining of the land, and your profits as a result are significantly lower. So while the land is cheaply available, all of the inputs that are required and the potential profit you're going to make is significantly lower. So it's really, I think, that a lifestyle that maybe is being sold here versus the very productive aspect of agriculture. And for some, that's that's perfectly fine. It, it works, especially for those that are looking at sort of that smaller niche type farming. With some of the images here, you can see that. In reality, for most of the, the farmers that are moving north, those that have the agricultural background and really want to stay within agriculture, that's not what they're looking for. And as a quick little um, anecdotal story, the, the picture in the center there is a group of old order Mennonites. So a very traditional religious group of individuals from Southern Ontario that have moved North specifically for um, social and cultural reasons, recognizing that their lifestyle was at risk in Southern Ontario. They couldn't get access to land. They couldn't afford the land. If they wanted a future in farming, which is the roots sort of of their community, they had to move North. 
And this group actually uh, was interested in moving to Manitoba, but happened to stop along their, their drive with the, the person they had hired into this little community in um, Northern Ontario, discovered lots of land available. The community was incredibly welcoming of them and they ended up moving here. And so it's an, it's an interesting thing to reflect on that over the course of 10 years or so, there's now three of these communities as well as two Amish communities. Um, and their expansion across the country is continuing and they are moving out east as an example. There's a number of communities in Prince Edward Island, and I suspect there will be some that move west as well. But again, the push to move is the, the access to land in southern Ontario and just the high cost. So recognizing that if land is potentially available in the north where it is cheaper, we will see movement. And those that will be successful, I think, will be like the old order Mennonites who have more of a community versus those individual farmers who are moving up without the community and potentially without the, the knowledge of the system as well. So really quickly in my, my last couple of minutes here, just thinking about what the future of farming actually looks like. And when I think of it in Ontario, and this is 100% my bias of growing up on a family farm coming through, but we can't continue to rely on farmers to solve the crisis. I think things like the development community in Ontario has really pushed farmland to be something that isn't valuable anymore for agriculture. The cost of the farm is just not conducive to what we are producing on it. And we have to get back to a system where we're valuing the farmland for the farm. And I don't know in Southern Ontario if we're ever going to get back to that point, but it's not a crisis that farmers can fix. Of course, for many, retirement for farmers is selling of the farm. And if that farm is slated for development, it's worth even more than it ever would have been as a farm itself. I think policies and funding models have to be more context specific. We have a problem here in Ontario where many policies are created in Southern Ontario and they're applied across the province and they just don't work in the North. It's not feasible to assume that what would work in rural Ontario, in rural Southern Ontario, I should say, will work in rural Northern Ontario, remote Northern Ontario, or with indigenous communities in the North where, they, where there's abundance of them. And I think we have to be more specific when we think of what these funding models are. We have policies right now that are pushing for attraction and retention of new migrants and new immigrants to Northern Ontario. And whether we're selling a dream that's realistic or we're selling something where someone will settle for a short period of time and then realize it's not the landscape for them and move back to Southern Ontario is the question. And we're seeing that play out right now with lots of lobbying in particular for livestock operations in the North. Farmers are moving. They're discovering that it isn't what they were expecting. Things like access to veterinarians, access to abattoirs, access to um, feed and, and other things. It's just not there yet. And so to lobby and to push for this migration to the north may be something that we really have to reflect on and, and consider other models and, and funding in particular if we expect that that's going to happen successfully. I do want to stress, though, I think there is room for all players in the field. The challenge, though, is I think those small niche farms are going to be OK. They have their own sort of base and, and those that they're selling to and they figured out what exactly they're doing and who they're marketing to. And the large consolidated farms aren't going away. They're likely going to get bigger. But the risk is that we just keep pushing out this sort of middle farmer. And when all the work I do with rural communities and rural community resilience, we know those medium sort of farmers are the backbone of many rural communities. And so if we lose them, we also risk losing a lot of rural places. And it's something we have to reflect on if we're willing to really give up on many of our rural communities. So just a, a really brief thank you, and hopefully I didn't go, to, go through things too quickly, um, but I'm always happy to chat. I have my email listed there, as well as my research website where most of the research reports are available. And then of course, social media where I'm trying to become more active and uh, consistent with what I post, but happy to chat if there are any questions. Thank you so much, Sarah. Another great presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, so we will move on to the Q&A portion pretty quickly here, but I think we have one final poll to run past the audience. So while it comes up, I'll just say it out loud. After what you've just heard, do you think that Canada has a healthy diversity of farm sizes and scales? Yes, no, or unsure? Just take a second for that. We'll see the results when we're done. So again, overwhelmingly, the answer is no. 
72% said that after what they've just heard, they do not think that Canada has a healthy diversity of farm sizes and scales. 8% said yes, and 20% said unsure. And that's fair, because what's a healthy diversity anyways, right? That's not very, anyways. <laughs> so um, again, thank you to the presenters. We'll move into a couple questions here. And I see that Andre is addressing at least one of them. Um, so that's good. We'll leave that one on the side for now and see what happens. But uh, one question that we have is, what are your thoughts on the impact of farm size viability with the advent of autonomous operating farm equipment? So I think that maybe the, the question here is, does it make it more viable or is there more desirability perhaps to have a larger operation with the increased efficiencies, which is something that we hear. I don't know if either of you have thoughts on that per se. I don't, I don't have, uh, this is not an area I know a lot about, but I think that there is at least the potential that those new technologies could make uh, smaller and medium sized farms more, more viable. Um, at least some, some of the, you know, some of the things that I've seen, uh, I saw examples at a, a farming conference in Aus Australia, these sort of autonomous uh, farming equipment that it's uh, kind of a much smaller and modular. I think that there's at least a, an opportunity or a possibility that that kind of technology could make it more viable, but it's a super interesting area for further research, I think. Sure. And it does I seem mean, to come up. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Sarah. Okay. I was going to add to you that the cost, I think, would be quite prohibitive for smaller farms. I think it's something that, um, depending on what you're, you're growing, if it's a crop, as an example, it feels like the large sort of cash croppers can probably afford some of that technology much quicker than many of the smaller scale farmers would be able to. And I mean, with technology and advancements, things do become cheaper over time, but I think initially it's it's still something for much larger scale farms. Sure. And just, you know, without um, pointing to any data, maybe just based on your experience, does it seem that with these technological advances, that's that's tied into this larger scale, um, sort of this, this consolidation on a larger end of the scale, it makes it more, um, I, su I suppose, it makes it easier to work the fields and, and to work the space, but also I feel like maybe there's some tie in between uh, financing and some of the larger operations that are required and then maybe demonstrating you have the technological capacity to do that. So um, yeah, that could be part of it. Now I'm just speculating. So we'll go to another question here. So, and I don't know if you have this data, but what percentage of farmland is rented? Uh, this one says, it seems to me there's a disconnect that has to happen and is happening to abandon the notion that land has to be owned to be farmed. So coming to that land uh, accessibility piece, uh, no one expects a shoe store operator to own his unit in the mall, valid. Why do farmers need to own their land when a well-designed lease would allow larger scale uh, and, and thus greater viability, I suppose. I believe this, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Sarah, I didn't, <laughs> didn't mean to beat you to it. Uh, it it's happening a lot. Uh, I, I was looking for the figure just now from the 2021 Census of Agriculture. I couldn't find it. But if I'm not mistaken, it's you know, somewhere around 40% of, of farmland is rented. It's, it's quite a lot. Uh, larger farmers do, do rent land. It's very, very common. Sometimes they rent uh, you know, a, a third or half or sometimes more of their land, and they do it precisely to expand their operation to uh, kind of optimize the amount of machinery uh, that they have. So it's very common. I think you would be hard pressed, however, to find farmers who would completely give up on the idea of owning their own land. Farmers almost always prefer to own uh, their land. Uh, I think more and more the question is becoming for different operations. How much do I want to own? How much do I want to rent? Because there are of course, uh, trade-offs to be made in, in owning and renting. So I think this is actually changing quite rapidly. That's great. Sarah, did you have anything to add or? Andre did a great job. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so we're just looking at the questions here. Um, so this is a more of a broad question that echoes some of the things we've been talking about. The phenomenon of a disappearing agriculture of the middle is also occurring in the United States. Do you have any ideas on how we might better support mid-sized farms? 
I'm happy to jump in really quickly and I can relate some of this maybe to the pandemic in particular because I think we saw a relocalization in some ways um, in terms of agriculture and food supply and food systems here in Ontario with the pandemic in particular again getting back to northern Ontario where communities maybe didn't have the same access to food as we did in more urbanized places. And so I think if there's a bit more of a relocalized system regarding, it depends on what you're doing for sure. If we're talking cash crops, I mean, I don't think there's going to be a localized market for cash crops per se, but depending on what's being grown, I think there is um, a more localization that's happening and a bit of a movement, especially around the cost of food happening, uh, likely across the world as we reflect on what that means and, and with inflation increasing. But I, I do think there that local support is critical, which gets back to the, the importance of rural communities. And as we have that farm consolidation, we really do you lose those farm families and, and rural communities in particular. And, and that's uh, definitely my bias, given that I'm a rural community researcher. But I think that that's part of the, the resilience of the entire model is dependent on these communities and these places as well. Thank you. Now, Andre, anything extra there? Good. OK. <laughs> This is something I was wondering about a little bit too. So we spoke about the requirement for oftentimes large organizations or, or um, you know, corporate structures to come in and then have the resources to buy up some of these land blocks. So the question here is looking at uh, whether either of the researchers have looked at foreign ownership of farmland. Uh, they say, I know that the policies vary by province, which limit foreign ownership, but I'm not current on these policies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can answer that one. Uh, the, the laws in the prairie provinces are quite strict. They're different in Ontario, but in the prairies, uh, non-Canadians can only buy very small uh, amounts of farmland. I think it's some provinces that they restrict it to 10 acres and in others 40 acres. So, you know, nothing, nothing close to what a commercially viable grain farm uh, would require. Uh, and those laws are quite strict. And my view is that they're functioning pretty well. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, there's no easy way around those, uh, those restrictions. So all of the investor ownership that we see in Saskatchewan and other prairie provinces, uh, those are Canadians, either Canadian citizens, Canadian permanent residents, or their trusts or other, you know, uh, uh, investor uh, entities, investor corporations that are 100% Canadian owned. So there's not a there's not a lot of foreign ownership happening in the prairie provinces. That's great. So I'm looking at the time. We pretty much only have time for one more question. I'll just I'll let the um, attendees know that any questions we don't respond to today, always feel free to follow up with the part participants. Uh, we also save these questions and and keep them sort of rolling forward for future events. But basically. Um, as a, as a final note, just to think about what are some of the mechanisms, policy or regulatory, that have been successful in preserving the farmlands from being sort of broken up or speculated on? I know that we mentioned green belts, uh, farmland preservation districts, and so on, but just a quick aside there to finish this off. So beyond, I think, the farmland, like the, the green belt here in Ontario, I think a lot of local planning policies are quite critical to make sure that if you're outside of a green belt, outside of provincially protected land, that the local um, community still has policies in place that is um, preserving the land. And I think it, the green belt's fantastic, but land outside of the green belt still being developed. So we just see leapfrogging happening instead. So it's only one sort of piece. There has to be local planning context, I think, as well, that really does protect the land and recognize that that future land base needs to be available. Yeah, that makes total sense. Andre, did you have anything to add? Uh, I'll maybe just say that the the context is really different as, as Sarah did a good job of explaining in, in Ontario compared to the, the prairies. We don't have nearly as much development pressure, but I do think that there's some, uh, you know, some big questions to be, to be uh, asked about the consolidation of land into these bigger and bigger blocks and to what extent that could be posing a real barrier to entry for newer farmers or even uh, for, for succession uh, and other things. And I'm by no means a, a policy person, but, uh, you know, my limited knowledge of what other jurisdictions and countries do is that, you know, they really regulate farmland sales much, much more carefully than we do. In France, for instance, there's kind of a kind of a local governing body for that, that 
looks at every farmland transaction uh, with a number of different criteria, social uh, and economic, right? They want to ensure it's being used. They want to ensure it's uh, going to continue uh, supporting the agricultural industry, but there are social criteria uh, that are applied as well. So I don't think it's impossible to think of ways that we could uh, regulate uh, farmland uh, transactions uh, in a different way if we could agree that our policy goal was to preserve uh, smaller and medium-sized farms. That's a big if, but important points. Thank you both so much. I'd like to thank our attendees also and our communication staff for all of the assistance putting this together today. Um, again, if you have any questions or, or comments, please follow up with the respective websites of our, our panelists today. And uh, on behalf of the Simpson Center, the School of Public Policy, thanks for being with us. We really appreciate it. And we'll look forward to you at the next one. Oh, and last point, uh, we'll send out a follow-up email that has a survey in case you wanted to provide feedback that way too. So thanks everyone. Have a great afternoon. <laughs>